40. All right. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, please. <clears throat> Turn to the book of John, chapter number 3. For those that can, let's stand and read a few verses of Scripture together. John, chapter number 3, going to begin reading in verse number 1. Christmas season. It's about gifts. The Lord's given us the greatest gift. Amen. Amen. John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Father, we pray that you'd be with us this morning for a few minutes as we preach your word. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us to study and to, uh, to learn from you. And we'd ask, Lord, this morning as we come together that you'd bless those that came to be here that you give them a blessing for coming, that we might all uh, be edified, that we might all be built up, that we might all learn together. And Lord, we just pray that your word would go out today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. How many people here know who George Whitfield was? George Whitfield? George Whitfield was probably the prime mover in the, what is called the Great Awakening of Europe and the United States when it wasn't the United States. Um, Mid-1700s, he uh, went to school at Oxford with the Wesleys. He uh, was doctrinally 180 degrees apart from the Wesleys, but they remained friends throughout their life. In fact, John Wesley preached Whitfield's funeral. Whitfield made seven trips to the United States and died in the United States and is buried. Uh, he's actually buried underneath a pulpit in a church think, I want to say, Newburyport, Massachusetts, but it's up there somewhere. That would be a little strange, preaching there, wouldn't it? <clears throat> Knowing that you had a man like John, John Whitfield right under, uh, George Whitfield right underneath you. So he preached thousands of messages. He preached four or five times a day, and a lot of his preaching was done outside. So he'd go, to a, he'd go to a town, he'd go outside of town, he'd find a big field that had a hill on it, and he'd go out there and he'd start preaching. And people would hear him. He was a small man, but he, had, he must have had a tremendous voice because it carried. And, and uh, he knew Benjamin Franklin really well, and you know Franklin was a mathematician and all that. He wanted, I don't know how interested he was in the gospel, but he was interested in math. So he went to one of, uh, when, when Whitfield was preaching in town one time, <clears throat> uh, Franklin went and, and listened to the message, and he would walk out until he could still clearly hear what Whitfield was saying. And he figured the circumference around that area of where he was, and allowing two square feet per person, George Whitfield could preach so it could be understood to 30,000 people outside. That's a voice. <clears throat> Probably no one would want to hear him inside. <laughs> I've heard a few people inside I thought were too loud. But God used that in him, and so he traveled all over the country. Um, people, that, that was back in the day when people actually perhaps wanted to hear preaching, and they would ask him to come. He'd get invitations from all over the place, and so he'd go places and preach. And, and uh, he... Um, preached on this text, you must be born again, it is said, over 3,000 times. And when someone asked him why 
he preached on this text so often, his answer was, you must be born again. Pretty good answer. So the last, uh, the last of, his, of his preaching, by the way, uh, all you got to do is Google him. You'll find all kinds of information about George Whitfield. Uh, he died at the age of 55 and had a tremendous impact on the world at, at, at 55. And the day he died, he had preached several times already. He was scheduled to preach at a, at a certain city, and I forget where the city was, but as he made his way to that city, people would gather around and they would ask him to stop and preach. So he would stop and preach. And they would say that he would preach until his throat bled on the inside. And, he would, and he'd go from place to place and they'd, on his way, and people would stop and ask him to preach. So he'd preach and they'd stop and ask him to preach. So he got to the city where he's going to preach. He preached there to thousands of people, and he went up to his room at night, and people began to gather around the window outside and call to him. Say, Reverend Whitfield, we didn't, you know, there are some here that, that had to work, and there were some here that were in the fields, and there were some here that didn't get to hear you preach, so we'd like to hear you preach. So he got a candle. It was dark. Didn't have electric lights back in those days, about 1750s or so. Um, got a candle, put it on a piece of wood, went out to the people. He said, I'll preach till the candle goes out. And so he preached, went up to his room. They went up there the next day in the morning when he didn't come out. They knocked on the door, no answer. They called out a few times, no answer. So they went inside. And they found Whitfield on his knees beside his bed. And the candle was burned out. Preached till the candle went out. You know, people would ask him, well, that was a different time than nowadays. Preachers would love it nowadays if people would actually ask them to preach, amen? How many times do you get that? Usually it's, oh, we have to go hear this guy again? You know, how often does that happen? But on this text, I don't know how you could preach it 3,000 times and preach it different every time, and maybe he didn't preach it different every time. But the subject matter is good subject matter. This is why Christ came. At this time of the year, when we think about the gifts of God, we think about the things that he has done for us. It's the Christmas season. This is why Christ came. So if we look at this for just a few minutes this morning and gather just a few thoughts from it, Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, teacher, master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now you never know when the Pharisees come to talk to Jesus, you never know if they're being honest or if they're just trying to butter him up or if they're trying to elicit some response that they can take exception to. So you, you never really know if, if when he came, if he was earnestly seeking to find the truth or... If he was just trying to butter him up a little bit and say, oh, we know you couldn't heal all these people if you weren't from God, and so we have some questions for you. You know, there were, there were always those type of people around. But irrespective of the kind of, of person Nicodemus was, and I don't know Nicodemus personally, it didn't matter to Jesus. What Jesus was going to do was to give him the truth. Rather, he was being sincere or whether he was being insincere. So what we have here to begin with is these are the words of Jesus. This is not just some preacher coming up with a good message. This is not just someone who, who tried to give an outline and put everything in the outline and get it all in the right place. And this is the word of God made flesh. This is the one who came to die for sins. This was not some nobody. These are the words of the Word of God who was made, made flesh for us. And they should serve as good instruction for us. And they should serve as truth if anything is truth. 
Now we hear a lot of, we can, you can read a lot of commentaries about what this all means. You can uh, read a lot of messages that have been preached on the text about what this all means. But maybe we could just try to listen to Jesus and we could know what it means. Amen? That's usually the preferred method. Before you get out all of your books and your theology books and your commentaries, just read the text and ponder on it and see if it will not explain itself. Because the Lord has a remarkable way of explaining it himself. And if you need extra explanation, first thing to do is look at other scriptures that talk about the same thing. Because God never contradicts himself and always explains himself. Amen. The only contradictions that come around in the word of God are the ones that we invent, trying to make one scripture disagree with another scripture. And therefore, we end up fighting with one another most of the time. These words that Jesus spoke were spoken to someone who was no novice. They were spoken to someone who was very knowledgeable. This guy was a Pharisee. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He knew his Bible. He knew his scripture. And when he came to Jesus, I'm not sure exactly what he was expecting, but Jesus as always, was very simple, very direct, very straightforward, and very unconfusing. And he answered the questions. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a student of the Scriptures. Nowadays, we might call him a theologian. He was a great uh, theologian, probably. He was a ruler of the Jews. He's one that made rules for other people. We'd all like to do that, wouldn't we? If we could only make rules for other people, we'd be all right. Problem is that most rules that people make for other people, they don't like to follow. That's why we have Congress. All right? They make laws for everybody else and exempt themselves. That's how that usually works. So Nicodemus had a question. Was it an honest question? I'm not really 100% sure if it was honest, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that Nicodemus had seen miracles, that Jesus worked. Let's say that he had heard other Pharisees and scribes uh, run him down. Let's say that he had an opportunity uh, to go and talk to Jesus, or he made the opportunity because he came to Jesus by night. How did he know where he was going to be that night? Must have been following him around. Or had someone else follow him around and come and tell him where he was. And so he came and he found him. Was he just trying to trick Jesus? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. We're not concerned about the words of, Nic of, of Nicodemus. We're concerned about the words of Jesus. Sometimes we make doctrine uh, from people who don't know what doctrine is. And so don't think too much about the words of Nicodemus. Think about the words of Jesus. The answer is the same. Whether, he was, whether Nicodemus was being honest or not, the answer is the same. So if we're honest or not, if we're seeking the truth or not, if we're religious or not, if we have a Savior or not, his answer to us would be the same. Some people come and, and uh, sit in church and mock the preacher. Oh, they may not do it outwardly they may just sit and say within themselves he, he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about some people may be honestly seeking some things from the word of god in either case the message from jesus will no doubt be the same Amen. it's not going to change just because our motives are sincere or insincere if if the Lord gives out the gospel, those that are attentive and listen, some will hear and be born again, and some will mock and go away. It's always been that way. Probably will always be that way. Used to be perhaps a fair division between mockers and unmockers. Nowadays, I think the mockers have us outnumbered. It doesn't matter. The answer is still the same. The word of God is 
Still the same. It's the same answer for everyone. And what is the answer? The first thing that Jesus says to him after, after Nicodemus uh, says these things to him, says no man can do these miracles except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see or he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. You cannot get a picture of the kingdom of God without being born again. That's good to remember when you hear people talk about scriptures and all the things that are in scriptures, but they don't have a working knowledge of salvation. If they don't know the word of God that was made flesh, then they're not going to have pretty good insight as to what he had to say. Amen. The first thing people need to understand is when they come, they need to listen to what John the Baptist and all the disciples and the apostles and everybody else preached the first time they got a chance to preach, which was repent and believe the gospel. After that, we can talk about doctrine. After that, we can talk about the Bible. After that, we can talk about all of the questions that people have about the Word of God. But until we get to that place, there's no basis for discussion. Yes, there are a lot of religious people who have no idea what it means to be born again. There are a lot of people sitting in pews today, probably in Baptist churches, who have no idea what it means to be born again. To understand the, the things of God. To understand what it does to your, to your soul and to your life. Now Nicodemus was a smart guy. He knew about the first birth. He knew about the natural birth. He knew about the water birth. And I'm not going to go into all the arguments about what, you know, what the water thing means. It doesn't mean baptism. It just means the regular birth. Because Jesus actually talks about that twice the same way. First time he says... Water and spirit, second time he says, flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit. Pretty straightforward. So Nicodemus knew these things. He knew that, that the birth of flesh is, the, is a birth that everyone experiences, but Jesus did not direct him to that birth. In fact, he took him away from that birth and said that what he needed was a different birth. Now, if you're here this morning and you are breathing... You have experienced birth. At least you are marginally alive. There is some blood flowing through your veins. You have some kind of life within you, even if you are nodding off to sleep. Right? Well, some people use church for that. Well, I heard a hard week, preacher, so I come here to sleep. All right, I have no problem with that. It's better to be here and sleep than stay home and sleep. Right? Because you might, you might hear something that would get in your head somehow. So Nicodemus understood these things about the first birth, but Jesus directed him to another birth, and he didn't know about that. A birth that he no doubt had not studied, a birth that he didn't really understand. But Jesus didn't back off from that. And we find that the, the explanation of Jesus was, as we continue, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? That's an excellent question, is it not? How can a man be born when he is old? Everything has to be of the physical realm to some people. That's why Christians find it almost impossible to talk with Muslims about anything scriptural. Because to a Muslim, if Jesus was alive, he had a dad. A real dad. A real physical dad. That's the only way it works. And that's the only thing they understand. So we may say that we're all going to the same place and Allah is God. Let me tell you something. Allah is not God. Allah is someone that makes everything work the way they say it works. That's not God. God is sovereign. God is a spirit. They don't understand that. 
Actually, there are some what we call regular religions that don't really understand that either. So the explanation of Jesus was that except a man be born again, he cannot see or he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, you can come and ask me spiritual questions. You cannot come and ask me questions out of the scriptures. But as Jesus would say in, in other places, said, ye come to see me. And ye, he said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have life. And they are they which testify of me. You want to know the scriptures? They're about Jesus. Every time you read a scripture, you should keep in mind that it's about Jesus. It's not just about history, although God is the author of history. It's not just about the way life started, although God tells us how life started. Everything in the word of God is about Jesus. Because he is the word of God. Except a man be born again, born from above, born spirit of spirit, then he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. Can't even see it. Can't even get an idea of what it is. Doesn't have any clue as to actually what goes on and what this is all about. So when you read in the, in the uh, first four books of the, of the Gospels of the New Testament that they went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you will not understand that, what that is unless you understand that it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. All of our arguments mean nothing until we're born again. Our positions on who's going to be in heaven or whether there's a hell or whether there's judgment or mercy or grace or all of those things don't mean a thing unless we have the new birth. And if you study the scriptures and keep an open mind, they will reveal to you not all the arguments. They will reveal to you Jesus. And they will bring you to that place. So Nicodemus, after Jesus says you must be born again, he starts talking about a second physical birth. Jesus is not having any of that. He just brings him right back again. He didn't, even, he didn't even address that, kind of. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So what Nicodemus said, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born? Now, to you and I, that would seem like a stupid question. That's why, you know, I'm not sure Nicodemus is being 100% forthright here. Although... Uh, I suppose the question is valid. If someone were to tell you that you needed to be born again and you had no clue as to how you could be born again, your first question might be, I don't see how that's possible. Right? Jesus says it is. So let's take Jesus at face value and say, if he's the word of God made flesh and he's the son of God and he says it's possible, I guess maybe we should just think that it's possible. So that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So Nicodemus, you're, you're in the wrong house here. said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you were to go back and somehow be able to regain your position in your mother's womb again, that would be flesh. Now, I don't know of anybody who has had two earthly births. I know, you know, sometimes twins start to come out and one starts to come out and then the other one's born first and all but that's still not really two births, is it, for one person? It's two births for the mother <laughs> who brings forth twins. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but he says this, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So the flesh is flesh. No matter what we do in the flesh, it's still flesh. If we try to serve God in the flesh, it's still our flesh trying to serve God. If we try to pray in the flesh, it's still our flesh trying to pray. If we try to dress ourselves up in a nice suit and come to church so that everyone will think that we're spiritual or at least that we have a nice suit, then that's flesh. And we're not in the right place. By the way, I have several new suits now. 
I couldn't wear any of them, so I took the pants all to a tailor, and I said, let these out as much as you can. <laughs> so she did, and I went back and got them, and now I have about six new suits <laughs> that I couldn't wear before. Or if I did wear them before, I couldn't breathe while I was wearing them. So the flesh, that only goes to prove that the flesh is, in fact, flesh. The more of it you get, the more you'll understand. <laughs> that the more of it there is. So no matter how good we are, it's just flesh. No matter how right we get, it's still just flesh. No matter how good a debater you are, and no matter how you can take theological books and all the Word of God and you can debate somebody with that, unless you have been born again as a child of God, you have no basis on which to do that. And you can win the argument and still go to hell. And I'm convinced there are probably lots of people that do that. Flesh is flesh, Jesus says, but spirit is spirit. Just uh, turn over to the book of 1 Peter for just a second because it's probably good to read this one. 1 Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> Verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, that means your old, vain manner of life, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls, not your flesh, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. Or from above, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. If you're going to be born again, it's going to be by the word of God, Amen. which liveth and abideth forever, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. So Nicodemus was not just hearing a rabbi. Nicodemus was not just hearing somebody that he sought out to explain the mysteries of life. Nicodemus was hearing the word of God from God. That's the best place to hear it from. Hear the word of God from God. It must then touch his spirit. It does no good to listen in the flesh and say, well, that's for somebody else. That's not for me. Or, well, I don't understand that. Well, we don't understand everything we believe, do we? And Jesus goes on, we'll talk about that in a minute, to explain that. But we can understand this. Flesh is flesh, and spirit is spirit. Now, how do we get to the spirit part? Well, what you need, Nicodemus, Jesus says, is you need a spirit birth. You've got a fleshly birth. Having another fleshly birth is not going to help you. You need a different birth than that. Not a birth that you can see, but a birth that you can know. He said, you can see a physical birth. I could have seen physical births, but I have not because I'm squeamish and don't want to. And back when we started having children, they wouldn't let dads in the delivery room, which was just okay with me. All right. And then by the time that we got to where they would let me in the delivery room, I didn't think it was good to break with tradition. So what you need, Nicodemus, is you need a spiritual birth. And a birth that you are going to know that it's there... Because you can 
hear the sound of it. Not somebody else, but you. You will understand that the word of God applies to your heart, not just to your flesh. You will understand because there's something that works on the inside of you, not just on the outside of you. It's not just a bunch of rules and regulations that says, this is how you have to live if you want to go to heaven. Not going to cut it. You can do that and keep your fleshly birth. Jesus said, flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. And there is a difference. So Nicodemus was hearing the word of God and it must touch his spirit. Now, in verse number 8, very interesting verse. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. The word wind in the... The second word in that verse is the same word that is spirit in the last word in that verse. It's pneuma. It's the same word. The spirit blows where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. So you can... You can see some effects. If the wind is blowing outside, has anybody a a actually ever seen the wind? You don't see wind, right? What do you see? You see the effects of the wind. Has anybody ever seen physically a spirit, a spiritual birth, where the Spirit of God comes and touches the heart of man and takes up a dwelling place inside. Has anybody actually ever seen that operation take place? No. But how do we know that it has taken place? The person knows that it has taken place because there's something going on in there that was not there before. While I might have felt guilt before, while I might have tried to do things in my flesh to please God before, there was no ability, there was no spiritual reasoning, there was no presence of God to empower me to do that. But now, after the new birth, God takes up residence, and what does he start doing? He doesn't just sit there in a rocking chair. He starts throwing stuff out. He starts stirring things up. He starts wanting his way. Because you have the earnest, as the Bible says, the earnest or the down payment of your inheritance. And he doesn't just sit idly by and watch you do all of those fleshly things that you think are good to do. And which is all built in because after all we are a rebellious and stiff-necked people. But at some point in time it begins to change things. And you start looking at things and say, you know, I used to do that and have a great time, but I don't, I don't know if I should do that anymore. And so we should press, as Paul says, press on to the mark, right? You can't do that if you don't have the spirit. There's nothing to press on with. There's no place to go. So wind here and the word spirit is the same word. Yes, they've made a differentiation in the translation. Yes, they've capitalized spirit in the, in the uh, last, last word because it's one born of the spirit, of the spirit of God. I understand that. But the actual operation that it's talking about is the same. The Holy Spirit works like the wind, like the Spirit. So you, can, you can't tell where it's going. That's like when the Word is preached and go out, it goes out. You can't really tell where it's going. You can't t tell where it's going to find a resting place. You can only tell if there's some sort of response. It's the only way. And if you're sitting here this morning and you have never responded to the Spirit of God, 
then chances are most likely you need to be born again. Because there should be something within us to respond to the things of God. So Jesus says, what you need, Nicodemus, is you need this spirit birth. You need this wind. You need this, this wind to blow on you. No one, no one that you can see is going, to, is going to be able to do this. One that you can know is going to be able to do this. And you know it's there because you can hear the sound. You know it's there because you can see the effects. You know it's there because if the wind blows hard enough, limbs start flying off trees. And things start picking up off the ground. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. They'll see some kind of evidence. There'll be some kind of change. There'll be some kind of difference. There'll be something that you can observe. So Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? And then Jesus goes on and explains a whole lot of stuff. And we're not going to go all the way through that this morning, but it goes all the way through how God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Spiritual birth. He that believeth, verse 18, on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Two classes of people, just two. Believers and unbelievers. Condemned or uncondemned. Jesus says this is where the rubber meets the road. You must be born again. How do I get this spiritual birth for Christmas? First of all, you've got to come to the Word of God. Get all of your preconceived ideas out of your head. What anybody who is operating in the flesh and just wanted you to be religious tried to tell you? Listen to what Jesus says. He would tell you that you must be born again. There's no other way. There's no other way to come to Christ except to come to Christ. Come to the Word of God. Why? Because He is the giver of life. This is the condemnation, verse 19, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Jesus is the giver of life. The giver of life. The spirit. Flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. How do I get the spiritual birth? Come to the word of God. He is the giver of life. Let him change your heart and your mind. No one else can do it. You can fight with yourself all you want. You won't come to any good conclusions. Let him direct your future. I do not know for 100% surety if Nicodemus was saved at this meeting with Jesus, but I do know that he understood the necessity of it. And I believe, since Jesus is the Word of God and the best possible exponent of his Word, that I believe that Nicodemus understood when he left what was necessary. It's not written in riddles. It's pretty straightforward. What do you need? You need to be born again. How do you need to do that? Flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. It's got to be by the spirit. When God says spirit, he means heart to heart. Heart to heart. Not flesh to flesh, but heart to heart. We're supposed to hide his word in our hearts, right? That's the only place you can hide it, is in your heart. You can't hide it in your flesh. It doesn't do a good job there. All it does is show us to be hypocrites. Let his word be in your heart. Call on him for salvation. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And whosoever believeth in him, verse 15, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, we hang on to this little bit of life we have down here, this vapor that so soon passes away. We think it's pretty important. In the grand scheme of things, to you, it may be pretty important. But you know what? Time has gone on a long time now. And there's been a lot of people come and a lot of people go. And all of those people, every one of those people that has come into this world, born of the flesh, flesh is flesh. If they want to be in heaven 100 years from now, spirit needs to be spirit. Spirit needs to be spirit. We need to let go of the flesh and grab the spirit. Jesus said, ye must be born again. Whosoever believeth in him should not <coughs> perish. This old body is going to fade away someday. And nobody's going to remember 100 years from now what it looked like. But Jesus said to his disciples that he went to prepare a place for them. And that he was going to come back and receive them unto himself. He said that where I am, there ye may be also. You know what you're going to need to have for that? You're going to have to have a spirit because the body's gone. You're going to have to have a spirit that was acted upon by the Holy Spirit. And the word of God that was made flesh in order to make a believer out of a non-believer. That has to happen at some point in time. So I leave you with this this morning. You must be born again. You must. There's no what if. There's no maybe. You must. You want to go to heaven? You must be born again. We don't like to talk about it. Better to talk about it now than 100 years from now. You must be born again. Amen. Let's all stand. Brother Adam, you come. Lead us in a verse of invitation. If you have a need this morning, you can come and tell the Lord about it. Jesus took time to talk to Nicodemus. Late at night, came and sought him out. He didn't have to spend time with him, but he spent quite a lot of time with him. He can spend time with you too. He has all the time in the world because he made it. Amen. And some of it he could have made just for you. If you have a need this morning, you come. What number are we going to see? 165.